Hi, I'm Richard Lee from the Hall Institute of Public Policy, and welcome to the Hall Institute Public Forum. Today's show is part of our ongoing New Jersey media landscape series. We're taking a look at what's happening in the news industry in New Jersey, kind of where we are, how we got there, where we're going in the future. And I'm very pleased to have two people with me who um, spent probably the greater parts of their career covering state government in New Jersey, and that's Harvey Fisher, who covered the, um, the State House for the Record of Bergen County, and Dan Weissman, who did the same for the Star-Ledger. Harvey, Dan, thanks for being here today. Sure. Okay. And before we start our conversation, I just wanted to you know, say to anyone who's watching this live, um, it is an interactive program. Um, if you want to join in the discussion, ask us a question, just look for the chat icon on your screen, click that, and you'll be able to take part in the discussion. We'll, we'll try to get your question or comment to Dan or Harvey during the program. So I thought it was kind of um, fitting that we talk about you know, live chats, webcasts, because we're talking about when you guys covered the State House. And I think our paths first crossed sometime in the mid 80s when I came down to cover Trenton. And it seemed like the two of you had been there for years, but maybe it really wasn't that much longer. But maybe we could start out by getting your thoughts on you know, what was it like covering state government, you know, when you were, you know, reporters covering the State House? Well, I got to the State House in 1972, I believe. Uh, and I worked for a uh, a relatively small paper, big name, but a small paper called the Elizabeth Journal. And I, uh, in those days, there were maybe 35 uh, reporters uh, at the State House every day, and another 15, 20 would come in on legislative days. And there was all sorts of action going on. Uh, I remember I was working for one of the smaller papers. I really had to hustle. Uh, especially on a legislative day, and uh, we'll be writing all sorts of stories, 12, 13, 14 stories all in one day. And then I'd go upstairs to the main lobby where the larger papers had the reporters, and I'd see some of these reporters playing poker. <laughs> uh, so it was a lot different, uh, but it, uh, it certainly was a challenging. Yeah, I mean, just the volume of reporters compared to what there, there is now, it's you know, probably not even half that many on a regular basis who you know, cover the state house. I think half is an overstatement. Yeah, yeah. And one of those places that had a large staff was the Star Ledger. Um, I don't know if Dan was ever playing poker you know, on no, legislative maybe. days, but. Um, never, never, never played poker. That, that, the poker game goes back, it predates me. Okay. Uh, and it was legendary in the. The Herald News office, where there was a big round table, four o'clock in the afternoon, big poker game, and uh, you know the button, the water cooler held a bottle, and people would imbibe. The put, put it, but but point is that I remember uh, working for a larger paper, the largest in, the, in the New Jersey, with the biggest staff. The demands on us were incredible. I my, my best day, I wrote twenty-one stories. Wow. Uh, a lot of them little briefs, the action yeah. in Trenton. Uh, we covered everything. Yeah, the Star Ledger, as I recall, was built itself as a paper of record. You wanted something on every bill that passed the committee? or. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, uh, it, it literally covered every single bill, and, and we would cover the, uh, the legislature or the, the assembly in tandem. It's, uh, my, my first brush with it was... Uh, 1971, I believe it was, I first came down here, and I remember Roger Harris and I would come down, and we'd cover the assembly, and he would sit there, we'd sit there and, and take notes on 10 stories, mm -hmm. and come back and write 10 stories, and go back in after the 10 were written. Um, and it was extremely competitive, and we were expected to have everything. So, you know, it was very different than now, because now everything is summarized, the, le the ledger's legislative pages are page, actually, mm -hmm. maybe one or two stories, but a lot smaller staff. But I think at the height, we had nine or ten people. I even lost track yeah. of how many we had. The big difference is uh, the, um, the, uh, most of the papers would provide a, a depth on the best stories of the day, then story one, two, and three. You would get depth reporting on that. And, and after that, it was Catch Us, Catch Can, and some of the other stories. Uh, nowadays, in most cases, you're not even getting depth on the major stories. Uh, so it's there's been a diminishing, yeah. a, a tremendous diminishing of the reporting going on at the State House. And it's very, very, very different 
in the years back, uh, press people had access to the floor, the floor of the, uh, of the State Assembly and the floor of the Senate. And, and you can go down and talk to a, a senator while they were voting on bills, and you really got a first-hand uh, idea of what was going on. Um, that, dis that disappeared, uh, oh, maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago. When they moved out of the... Yeah, uh, yeah when they moved to the new chambers. Yeah. yeah, but you know, the thing is, too, that ironically, sometimes we serve the purpose because you go up to you know, assemblyman or, or a senator and ask a question and he would look at you and say, well, I didn't know that. <laughs> you know, and we had yeah, access to certain things like every bill that was introduced, we, we could find somewhere. You know, there was a bill room, and, you know, you go in and get copies. Um, now, it's a lot easier to get information now, which makes it more, uh, I, I don't know how to express it, but less challenging and less um, less sought after. Mm -hmm. You know, you could get something really simple. Remember what it was like to get a corporate yeah. lookup? Oh yeah, you used to have to drive to another office in Ewing and, and, and pay five dollars mm -hmm. and wait for somebody to take your information back and then bring it back to you and give you one. Or you'd have to you get the, the old there. microfilm, you'd have to put it on the machine. If information is handed to you, uh, there's no reason for you to go digging. That's the mentality. That's unfortunate for us when you when the reporter digs for information, he or she will get more than what would more ordinarily be handed to him. So that has really changed the, uh, the focus of uh, reporting. Uh, and of course, the uh, internet has made a, a huge, a huge uh, change in the reporting because now reporters don't just cover something, sit down and write it, or think about it and then write it. Now reporters cover something and they immediately have to turn something out, immediately have to turn something out for the internet, for the inter for their newspapers, the internet operation. There's a tremendous um, uh, fall off in local reporting. Uh, usually, especially on state house days, most papers sent, even small papers, sent their reporters to the state house to provide some local coverage. <clears throat> the home news may be interested in what's happening in North, North Brunswick and, and, and so forth, or the Camden paper may be, uh, one of the Camden papers may be interested in what's happening in some of the towns there. And, Local coverage became pretty good. You don't get local coverage anymore. Yeah, I think one of the examples I use when I teach is, you know, coverage of a state budget. Now you have, Gannett has six New Jersey newspapers. You're pretty much going to see the same budget story in all six as opposed to what you were saying. I remember when there was a budget, you know, the Asbury Park Press would have something about short protection funds, Courier Post, you know, urban renewal funds. But now it's it's probably a good budget story, but it's, it's generic to all six newspapers. I, go ahead. Also, the budget was covered much differently in, I, I hate to use the term our day, but our day, we covered the hearings, the pre-budget hearings, and did a lot of in-depth reporting there. The budget itself, when it was passed, was usually a three-paragraph story. Mm -hmm. It was anticlimactic. You knew everything that was going into it, unless there was some, some big crisis or some big uh, fight. And I think that all changed probably with the Florio budget, the first Florio budget, with the tax increase. That's right, yeah. You know, that, um, and, you know, another another thing, and then Harvey mentioned the internet. I, I tell you that reporters are under an enormous amount of pressure now because you almost have to write before you think. Yes. You've got to, you know, we're wire services. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was just going to say. It used to just be AP and UPI were like that now. No matter who you work for, you need 15, to get your story 15, out. There. Fifteen minute uh, deadlines, and and you know, and, and ever a really hungry beast at, at, at the, the computer, mm -hmm. uh, demanding more and more and more and updates. You have to have, you have to be first. Well, we had to be first too, but sometimes we actually took the position that you know maybe we should be right mm -hmm. before first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you think the the net effect has been of the change? Say on the public, are they you know? better off, worse off? Are they more informed because they have information so accessible and, and quick now? Or um, was it better when, you know, people had the relationships that, say, you cultivated, you know, with sources, with legislators, and to, had the 
were able to take the time to do an in-depth story. I think the public uh, is not better off. Yeah. One, two, I think the public doesn't know it's not better off, yeah. doesn't know what it's missing, uh, and, and that's unfortunate. Uh, again, you go back to that, uh, what I was talking about, local coverage, uh, it just it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, the public may not realize that. Of course, the public is changing. The readers of 20 years ago may not be the readers uh, or uh, news hounds of, of today. Um, and and that's, that's a big change. The public doesn't know. The public, it's a term that really you know, doesn't exist. There is no public or yeah. specific elements of the public. Uh, kids don't read today. And uh, people, they look at the circulation numbers, you see that newspapers are, are, are hurting. Uh, more news has gotten from the internet or talk radio, which is, has, makes no pretense at all about being objective. So, you, you know, may, maybe it's idealistic. We used to filter a lot of the stuff for the public. Mm -hmm. You know, I think get, get both sides of a story and, uh, and be accused of bias by both sides, which was the idea. Which, yeah, it kind of meant you were doing uh, a good job, yeah. Now it's, you know, you and I are both teach in journalism. Mm -hmm. I have a class of 20. Yeah. On any given day, how many read today's paper? Maybe four hands will go on. Mm -hmm. How many have ever read a newspaper? Maybe eight hands will go on. So it's, it's a different way of getting information. It's totally un unfiltered. You get blogs that just, uh, you know, spout off in something, and uh, you know, one of the principles of propaganda that you know, the more often you repeat something, the more it becomes true, mm -hmm. which I think is easier today than, than ever before. Yeah, and one of the big changes that I know, especially in terms of campaigns, is you know, candidates, campaigns can put information out, get it directly to people, not without going through the scrutiny of a journalist who's going to you know, raise questions or get the other side of the story. And as you said, a lot of people now are getting their information that way. And, um, you know, maybe as Harvey said, the public doesn't know what it's missing. You know, they're just getting that one side and that's what they're making their decisions on. So, uh, how have some of the relationships changed over the years? You were talking earlier about, you know, your relationship, you know, with the people you covered that on one hand, there was a sense of camaraderie, uh, but when it came time for business, everybody understood that, you know, that's what you did. I remember uh, telling a, uh, a state senator that I would uh, uh, really love to be friends with him, but I can't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he said, why did you say that? And I said, well, the day may come where I have to hand you up. <laughs> and he seemed shocked. But basically what I was telling him was that uh, I have to remain somewhat distant um, and I can't allow uh, familiarity to uh, get in, or try not to allow familiarity to get into my uh, psyche, if you will, my uh, uh, reporting abilities. Check the relationships. The first day I was at the State House, again, this is in the 19, early 1970s, uh, uh, the Senate, one of the senators I was supposed to be covering uh, uh, waved me over. Hey, uh, hey, Harvey, come on over here. He says, let's go downstairs. And he took me to the coat room, which, which was actually the drinking room. <laughs> All sorts of booze at that place. Uh, the relationships are, are, are markedly different. Uh, uh, we would uh, uh, have long conversations at times with, uh, with legislators, off the record conversations. Uh, uh, we might uh, share a drink or share a dinner with them, uh, but uh, again, there was always the, the parting of the ways because we had a job to do afterwards. Uh, I don't think you have that. Of course, politics has changed tremendously. Uh, the animosity re between both parties is, uh, is uh, mind-boggling uh, to people like myself and probably to you fellas who, who covered it when there was some camaraderie there where they, uh, they would fight, but at the end of the session or the end of the day, they'd uh, slap each other on the back and laugh about it. Yeah. Uh, now it's animosity during the day and animosity at the end of the day. Yeah, it just seems to be more confrontational between the parties. Yeah. Everything, you know, there were bounds. There were, there were boundaries that you could, you could have a personal relationship with someone. Uh, I used to drive these guys crazy because I used to go to lunch with the uh, 
the governor's uh, deputy press secretary every day. Mm -hmm. And everybody in the press corps figured I was getting everything from him. So therefore, the lunch crowd started with two and grew to four and eight and 12 and grew exponentially until it was like, you know, like a regular convention every day. Uh, and I did that purposely, but I went to ball games with people. I, you know, there was, I, I felt you could, you could be friends with somebody and yet cover them. And they understood that there was you know, a job to be done yeah. was a job to be done. Um, but now everything is adversarial and, you know, strict lines are drawn. And I wonder sometimes how you get to the really good stories. Mm -hmm. If you can't just sit down sometimes with somebody and have an informal conversation and in that conversation something comes up that's legitimate, you can go follow it. Yeah. Uh, it's, I don't think it exists anymore. Yeah. So, um, when and how did that change? I know it didn't change overnight, but like, you know, what? How do we get from th that period to where we are today? The gate. That's it. All right. The gate. Yeah. Oh. Explain that. Well, when Christy Whitman was governor, mm -hmm. uh, before that, we could walk in and out of the governor's office as the public could, which you can't do now and just hang there mm -hmm. and wait to see what was happening. Uh, then one day, a gate appeared, and you had to be buzzed in. Right. Um, and that, that was, the, you know, that was the, the Iron Curtain. Boom, here it is. You can't cross without a passport or without a visa or without showing your papers. Um, it was building to that point. I think that was the final blow. Yes. And no governor who came after her, Republican or Democrat, is taking the gate away. Mm. Well, Don D. Francisco took it down momentarily. Yeah. But then when he was, uh, when Jim, Jim, uh, Jim McGreevy came in, the gate, you got uh, a lockbox on it. And, yeah. Well, you were part of that administration. Yeah, I could never figure out how to get out sometimes. I guess, you know, well, it was a little tricky like when I was working on well, the that inside. Was, that was like going to a bank yeah. and going to see a loan officer. Yeah. You had to wait to be buzzed in. Yeah. Of course, the big difference is the lack of competition. Fewer reporters, fewer newspapers assigning reporters to the state house means a lack of competition. Competition. Dan and I were in competition often, right? And if he got a story that I didn't get, he was on a high. And if I got a story that he didn't get, I was on a high. Uh, and that serves the public well. It's not just us, the two of us. Or well, our papers that serves the public well because we went out looking for good stories. We tried harder to develop stories uh, that, uh, rather than just uh, some rudimentary facts about uh, something that took place. Uh, uh, and the competition is missing now. You know another thing that there was a time when if I wanted to talk to an assemblyman or assemblywoman, I would call the assemblyman, assemblywoman, and ask a question. Mm -hmm. One time, and it really, it really struck me that one assembly woman, I won't mention her name, I had to talk to her press liaison, her chief of staff, her policy advisor, and on down the line, there must have been four or five people to ask a very simple question. And eventually I said, I don't need it. Yeah. Uh, and that, you know, that, that I think is the biggest change of all, that everywhere you go, there's a public information officer, deputy public information right. officer, and all layers of, of uh, preventing you from getting to the person. Remember, we used to walk into the treasurer's office, uh, and, and you want to see the attorney general when they were over in the uh, state house annex? Mm -hmm. You went up, you got off in the, what's it, the fourth floor? I forget, third or fourth floor? You knocked on the door, is the attorney general in here going to talk to him? even in the justice complex. You can't do that now. Yeah. And that takes away a lot, too. Yeah. Another thing kind of along those lines that troubles me is so many of the quotes get emailed back to reporters, so you don't have that give and take. You know, well, you know the reporters will have to email their questions so somebody can kind of craft the wording and you know, it goes back that well, way. Well, very often the, the, you know, the reality is the first question a reporter asks, the answer to that question is going to be, a, Fundamental. It's it's, it's not going to it's not going to be an answer. Yeah. So the follow question is where you get the answer. If you have a good 
tough follow-up question, that's when you get the answer, especially when you're on TV. And then the first response is a nothing response. So you really need a, uh, the reporters, TV reporters, really need a, a good uh, uh, follow-up question. There's no opportunity now for follow-up questions. Basically, no opportunity for follow-up questions. So you get canned quotes. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I wonder if people like one another anymore. Yeah. You know, is it, it, we, we, we had a huge press corps, yeah. uh, and there was a tremendous amount of camaraderie. We would party together, we would, you know, laugh together, we'd play softball mm -hmm. together, we'd, uh, we'd go out together, and, you know, we, we'd compete, but there was a friendship. Now even that's adversarial. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, we were talking about the relationship between reporters and sources, but yeah, I think the relationship among reporters has changed significantly as well. You know, the, the, uh, Mark Magyar, who was one of your colleagues, I remember one story in particular had to do with nursing homes. And Joe Whitlow and I were on it, Mark Magyar with the record was on it, and Denny Cullen of the Courier and Camden was on it. And Mark always said, we didn't compete. Each one of us daily would have another revelation, but we fed one another. And you know, maybe the home offices got a little uh, annoyed or, or got reacting, how come you didn't have that right. story? But the point is that we worked, not consciously together, we actually worked together and ferreted the story out. I don't know if you see that anymore. Yeah, one of the strangest things that's happened in terms of cost cutting, trying to save money, has been the merger of the two bureaus where he used to work, which to me was very bizarre. And I think Harvey was talking about how competition drives good stories. And when I saw that happening, you know, I, I could see, you know, how it made sense from a business standpoint. But if you have reporters who used to thrive on the competition, I don't, I don't want to get beat by this guy or that guy. And all of a sudden you're working side by side. Uh, I think the, it's got to hurt in the end product. Yeah, the Exxon Mobil um, yeah. mentality. You know, perhaps we overstated it, but as reporters, we always felt we were doing the, my term, the public good. Yeah. Uh, and now the public good has given way to the business, to business making a buck. And, and you can't necessarily blame newspapers for having a hard time staying alive. Yeah. We, we have a uh, question from the internet. Oh, okay, great. Uh, I think this is backtracking a bit. Do you care to elaborate on first versus right with regards to the false reporting of the death of Gabby Gifford, Giffords by NPR? Oh. Anybody um, want to? I mean, I guess you talked earlier about how, you know, in the day, you know, it was important to get things right. And now, because of the speed which the pressure people are under, stuff gets out there that's incorrect. And then it gets uh, recirculated, the incorrect yeah. information gets Which I, I think in, in this case, the New York Times had it on its website, which it picked up from some other news sources. So. That, uh, you know, that, that's one of the casualties of, uh, of, of, of the speed of information flowing. It, it, you know, fast is not always better. Yeah. But then again, um, it's what, I use the term these guys use, the public demands. Mm -hmm. And maybe whoever reported it uh, heard it, and instead of trying to find out if it was really true, said, I'll go with it, and right. if I'm wrong, I'll correct it later. Yeah. And I don't know if they made that conscious decision. I don't know if it, the public demands all that. The public may demand, and, and its interest, uh, people's interests uh, interest may be piqued on a major story. Uh, but right now, the public demands is on everything. Everything is, is being put out very quickly, uh, and it's often not, not always correct, and even worse, the incorrections are not later corrected. Yeah. Uh, so it, uh, it remains forever in the public domain, on the internet, it remains uh, uh, forever as a, an erroneous report that has not been corrected. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're nearing the end of our time. I wanted to just maybe throw out one last question. We've been talking a lot about, you know, how things were better, you know, back in the day. I mean, talk about, you know, what's good now. I mean, you know, I, I always tell people it depends if you look at the glass being half empty, half full. And, you know, you've both made excellent points. On the other hand, you know, we live in an era where, you know, we get news and information instantly and more conveniently than ever. I mean, what do you see as the positives uh, about the news industry today? Or? 
Well, since the news industry, uh, since newspapers had to um, uh, cut back, lay lay off, uh, or buy out uh, its uh, many of its uh, major uh, newspaper reporters, veteran reporters, um, it uh, it allowed allowed maybe the wrong word uh, newspapers to begin hiring young people. So now we have a, a, a huge influx of. Uh, young reporters who perhaps will bring different ideas, different mindsets uh, to, the, uh, to the profession. Hopefully that will be the case. That's one of the changes that's taken place. Uh, uh, initially, it was not good to get rid of the reporters who had covered, uh, a, uh, covered the environment for 20 years or covered the state house for, for 15 years because they, they had with them all sorts of knowledge. Uh, but now you may have a new, uh, a new crew uh, uh, gaining some of that knowledge and some of that experience and providing good reporting. I may sound like a hypocrite, but the speed with which you can get information and the ability to get it. Uh, you know, years ago, I remember, for some reason, I was interested in a typhoon that struck uh, Formosa. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember why, yeah. but I was able to tap into the English language newspaper in Taipei mm -hmm. to get the information. Uh, in back in our day, I would have to go down to the AP office, UPI office, and wait for the the bulletins or the, the, the sketchy reports to build. Right. So I, you know, build, build until I can get the whole story. I was able to get it. Mm -hmm. uh, I find that you know remarkable, a, a great uh, great convenience and advantage. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, well, hopefully you know some of these. You know, positives will, you know, continue to develop and, you know, we'll see. You know, I think the industry is always going to survive. I tell people that there's an intangible about journalists, you know, just, you know, despite what's happening in the business side, there's always going to be good journalists who want to get the story, who want to get information out to the public, and hopefully that continues. You have to give people the incentive to go into it. I don't know how you do it. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the hope for survival of newspapers uh, uh, comes down to content. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, you have a lot of pseudo news organizations, mm -hmm. uh, which are really taking the, the content of newspapers and running it on as their own, effectively right. running it as their own. Uh, if newspapers go out of business, I don't know where the content is going to come from. Yeah. So that is a saving grace, the potential saving grace for newspapers. But it still doesn't uh, change the fact that the, the uh, Reporting in most cases is not at the level that it was in the past. Yeah, you no, know, one other thing, yeah. and, and again, <laughs> the hypocrite in me comes out. You read some of these blogs that the kids are reading today, and they're actually fun. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't take themselves seriously, and they, they, they inject their own viewpoints into stories. Uh, as long as you accept it for what it is. Right. And unfortunately, a lot of people accept it as the gospel. And that's that, the advantage and disadvantage in the same, the same context. Yeah. So, yeah, well, we're really at a pivotal juncture, so we'll try and understand it. And I thank the two of you again for you know, sharing your, your thoughts on this issue and you know, being guests on the program. So uh, with that, um, this is Richard Lee from the Hall Institute of Public Policy. We've been talking with Harvey Fisher and Dan Weissman about the state of journalism in the past, today, and in the future. Thanks for watching. Uh, please join us again next time. <laughs>